Wesley. Hey Gator Wesley. We are so glad you decided to join us for Worship's Night. You could have chosen to be anywhere tonight and it means so much to us that you're here. There are a few things coming up that you're going to want to know about. Family groups are starting to meet this week. We are so excited for all of the groups to start meeting and we can't wait to hear about your experiences. If you haven't heard from your family group leader yet, keep an eye out because they should be reaching out to you soon. Monday, October 19th marks the beginning of a new book study on Just Mercy. This book study is part of our Act Justly ministry, and we know it's going to be a great opportunity to learn more about how mercy can overcome injustice. On Tuesday, October 20th, we will be hosting a merge on the patio at 7 p.m. This week, we'll be getting into the Halloween spirit by painting pumpkins. We're really excited to see everyone getting creative. Also, Worship on the Lawn is next Sunday, October 25th. We really hope to see you all there for some really great worship, an awesome message, and to be in community. We hope you enjoy Worship's Night, and we're so glad that you're here. Have a great week. What's up Gator Wesley? We are so glad that you are here. We hope that you've had a great week and are ready for worship. Tonight's reading comes from the book of Philippians chapter 2 verses 1 through 11. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for bringing us all together to hear your word tonight. I pray that we learn something new about you that we can take into our everyday lives. Please watch over us as we go into another week and help guide us through any troubles we may face. In your name we pray, amen. Hello, my name is Heather and I am one of the co-directors here at Gator Wesley. So glad to be with you tonight. I hope that you've had a great weekend. It's absolutely crazy for me to think that we are halfway through this fall semester. I know that it has been a different kind of semester and we have not been able to be together in worship like we have in the past, but I am thankful for this opportunity to be with you wherever you are tonight. So last week we began to look at the book of Philippians. If you weren't here or you haven't had a chance to watch Joel's video, I would highly recommend that you take 10 minutes this week and watch it. Additionally, there are some great resources at BibleProject.com about this book of the Bible and others. So just a quick recap of what Joel shared with us last week so that you can have some context for where we will be going tonight. So Philippians, it's a letter that was written by the Apostle Paul while he was in jail. It's a mere four chapters long and was written to a community of Christians in the city of Philippi. This was a Roman controlled city and scholars believe that this letter was written sometime in 50 AD. Paul, as you may remember, was a Jewish convert. He experienced a radical conversion and went from being a persecutor of Christian, Christians to this man who not only helped to establish communities of faith, but now was writing letters encouraging and supporting them in their following of Christ. So, as with all scripture, it is important to take into account the fact that this letter was written by a real human to other real humans in a real place in real time. All the culture and the context of that time should be taken into account when reading Philippians. And as Joel pointed out, the letter to the church in Philippi starts with a thank you note. I suggested to Joel last week that he should include as a part of his sermon a bit from Jimmy Fallon and read you some biblical thank you notes. Like, for example, thank you, Paul for writing those couple of sentences about women in church that have successfully kept us from leading and preaching in many churches for centuries. It's not really that funny, I know. Joel didn't like it, I, my idea either. But any, anyhow, Paul does begin by offering thanks for and gratitude for this community, and then begins to pull the reader forward into the mission of the church. 
He emphasizes in his letter, trust amongst the community members, the importance of offering one another grace and peace, and a reminder that the day of Christ is near and that as a community, they could each be participants in the redemptive work of Christ. A pretty uplifting, encouraging way to start a letter off. So tonight, we're gonna to take a look at the second chapter of this letter, the second section of this letter. This chapter contains within it a very familiar section to many of you probably called the Christ Hymn. It is well known and often quoted and referred to as a way of understanding the work and life of Jesus in the world. We'll get to talk more about that in a minute. But it's interesting when you look at different translations of the Bible, how you find chapter titles or heading. So heading. So in the NRSV version of this scripture, the heading of this chapter is imitating Christ's humility. And this chapter really does encapsulate that idea. It's Paul's attempt to point to Jesus and to help us recognize that the character of Jesus should spill over into our lives as we work to imitate Christ. So Alex read the scripture for us a minute ago, and I'll read it again in a minute. But before we dive in, let's unpack this word humility or humble. Humble comes from the Latin word for low or close to the ground. Its definition is modest or low view of one's own importance. And I want to offer some clarification here because sometimes this word gets used to mean that a person, a humble person, has low self-regard or a sense of unworthiness. But that's really not the intent of the word here in this context. I love how the author C.S. Lewis defines humility. He says, humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. So with that in mind, let's jump into the second chapter of Philippians. Paul begins with a reminder to this community of what is possible with Christ. He says, if there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the spirit, any compassion and sympathy. And it's important to note that the word if in Greek is different than how we use it. Our if can mean maybe, maybe not. But in Greek, it's more like if and there is. So to read it again, if there is any compassion in Christ and there is, if there is any consolation from my love, and there is, if there is any sharing in the spirit and compassion or sympathy among you, and there is, then Paul goes on to list behaviors that he'd like to see out of the people that he says would complete his joy. Paul says, be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord. And one more time for the people in the back to make sure you heard it, he says again, be of one mind. Clearly, Paul wanted to emphasize this idea of being of the same mind. But I don't think that Paul means that we all need to think alike or like the same kind of food or books or have the same opinion on which is better, Coke or Pepsi. There's this quote from John Wesley that I think really gets at the point of what Paul is talking about here. John Wesley said, though we cannot think alike, may we not love alike? May we not be of one heart, though we are not of one opinion? So I think what Paul is saying to this community is, can we at least agree on love? Can we let love be our mindset in all things? Then Paul goes on and he lists some behaviors that he doesn't want to see in the community. He says, do nothing from selfishness, do nothing from conceit, do not look after one's own interests. A theologian, Fred Craddock, said this about those directions given from Paul. He says, what we do know for sure, however, is that Paul regarded as inappropriate to the body of Christ, the selfish eye, the pompous mind, the ear hungry for compliments and the mouth that spoke none, the heart that had little room for others and the hand that served only the self. Then Paul says this, let the same mind be in you that was in Jesus Christ. Simple, right? Easy. <laughs> Have the same mind as Christ. And this, this is where the Christ hymn begins. This likely would have been familiar to the reader of this letter. They may have even been able to sing as we believe that this could have been set to music at one point. Have you ever experienced that, by the way, where you read a scripture and then you remember a song from church or youth group that uses that same, pass that same exact passage? So I'm going to read you again from Philippians chapter 2, picking up at verse 5. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every other name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So let's unpack this a little bit because one reading of the scripture could potentially lead down a path of self-centeredness. 
Humble yourself now and eventually you'll be number one. I saw a quote this week that kind of reminded me of this idea. It said, do you wish to rise? We'll begin by descending. Do you plan a tower that will pierce the clouds? We'll lay down first the foundation of humility. That was from St. Augustine. And this kind of approach to humility leads to a place where we see humility as a means to an end. Be humble and you'll receive reward in the end. Such thinking turns the text into a strategy for advancement and the gospel of Jesus Christ offers success and room at the top. Last now, first later. A careful reading of the text, however, makes it clear that Christ emptied self, served and died without promise of reward. The extraordinary fact of Christ's act was that Christ acted in our behalf without view of gain. That is precisely what God has exalted and vindicated, self-denying service for others to the point of death with no claim of return, no eye upon a reward. So this section of scripture reminds us that the central event, event in the work of salvation is an act of humble service. Think about it for a second. The God of the universe, the creator of all things, chose to become human. This is something a lot of us in the church take for granted or maybe don't stop and think about often enough because we've grown up hearing it. But these verses from Philippians 2 call us to see again, maybe for the first time, how radical this God is and what that means for our lives. In the ancient world, a God who was born in human likeness was a self-demoting God, hardly the sort of God useful for human life. One author said, it's one thing for Zeus to become human for a day to play tricks, but it's quite another for the God of the universe to empty himself, taking the form of a slave. That is to take on flesh, become human, suffer and die. Who needs a God like that? This God, she said, doesn't sound like a winner, like a mighty deity who comes to the aid of powerless humans, or like a super kick butt and take names deity we want on our side. In fact, this author says, ancient folks were unlikely to trust the judgment of a loser God who chose this sort of downward mobility. Because in the Roman empire, dominance, victory, ascendance signaled power and authority. The culture would not see a possibility for humility, servitude, submission, even death to signal power and authority. Yet verses six through eight tell us everything about this God that we need to know, that Jesus empties himself, becomes a servant in order to fully inhabit humanity, to fully incorporate human life into divine life. This God loves and longs for us so much that God entered fully into the human world, not putting on a human suit for a day, but submitting to all the indignities and joys of human life, including death. This God does not withhold love until we rise to a divine level, but rather stoops to our level, scoops us up in all of our messiness, and makes us part of God's own life. So what does this mean for how we live? Back to the heading of this chapter, imitating Christ's humility. Against the cultural narrative that tells us winning is everything, those who follow Jesus take on an entirely different attitude about life. We can have the same mind that was in Christ Jesus, being humbled by the same love that was in Christ Jesus, and equally countercultural. It is our humbling job that we get to be fully human. I want to encourage you to take a moment with me and remember some of the acts of Jesus, where we see his love, where we see his humility. Remember the story of the woman at the well, where Jesus crosses boundaries, going out of his way to meet this woman and offer her living water. The story of Jesus washing the feet of his disciples, literally taking on the role of a servant. The many times that Jesus would perform a miracle or healing and say, shh, don't say anything about this. I don't need the attention. I don't need the accolades. The cross, a Roman crucifixion, save for criminals. Paul is encouraging the reader of this letter and now us to imitate Christ's humility in how we live and work and take classes with and are in clubs with and share space with all of those in our community. Living a life of humility takes intention and practice. This isn't something that comes naturally to many of us. It's hard work, but it is the way of our Lord and Savior. If you remember when he called the disciples, he didn't say, watch me. He said, follow me, do as I do. So how can you imitate Christ's humility in your own life? How can you look towards the interests of others more than your own? How can you empty yourself to find room to love and to serve? As I close in prayer, I wanna say that these things are not meant to be rhetorical questions. I really want you to think about how you in your life can truly imitate the humility of Christ. Ask God to open your heart and your mind right now to how God may be speaking to you about this. Let us pray. Humble God, who came and lived and walked amongst us, who taught us through the life of Jesus how to be humble, how to think of others more, how to lay down our lives, how to give and serve with no expectation of reward or gain. We come to you tonight and we give thanks. 
We come to you tonight and we ask God for you to begin a work in our heart, for you to begin to help shape us and mold us into people who can imitate Christ's humility. Every day it's a challenge. Every day it's a goal. And so we ask God that you come right now into our hearts, into our minds. Give us room, give us space to really think about how we can live this kind of life, what you would have for us. How would we, how would we begin to be like your son, Jesus Christ? I give thanks for this time and space where we have to look back at these letters preserved over time with messages, with inspiration, with knowledge that we can learn about you and love each other better. In your name we pray. Amen. Hey, before you go, I want to encourage you to um, watch this video that we're about to show. We've been talking over the past few weeks about the election and about voting. Um, and what is real in our world is a history of voter suppression, that folks that are on the margins, folks that are typically disenfranchised, are given less of an opportunity to express their voice through the vote. This happens currently in our country right now and has happened since um, our country was founded. And so this is a short video that just gives you a look at the ways that voter suppression um, plays out in our country and hopefully will encourage you to get more involved in making sure that every person's voice is heard through the voting process. Have a great night. There make, needs to be more alignment around that. This isn't about the Republicans or the Democrats. The bottom line is voting is a nonpartisan issue. The right to vote means to me on um, having a voice, on um, being able to participate in the political process, being able to be engaged from top to bottom, on um, whether it be just from casting a ballot or maybe potentially running for office. There's a lot of things that start with our right to vote. I once thought my spiritual life was separate from and more significant than my civic life. As a pastor, I operated in this way. I was always involved in the community, but it was secondary. I now know this was wrong. I know this was a luxury grounded in privilege. As the midterm elections rapidly approach, there's been a rash of voter identification conflicts in states across the country. Laws across the U.S. are being passed to make it harder, not easier, to vote. Since the 2016 election, nine states with- I'm waiting in line to vote. It is 1145 in Georgia, and guess what? We're still at a polling site. My point is that the laws are wrong. We have to fix those laws because as long as we have eligible American citizens who cannot cast a ballot, then the game is rigged because in a democracy, you should be allowed to make your voice heard. Look, the history of voter suppression in the United States is a history of racism, mm -hmm. okay? It is about preventing certain groups from voting so that other groups can maintain power. There's no other reason to do it. You're in a democracy, you want everyone to, to vote, you know? Um, unless you're trying to keep one group in power. Mm -hmm. But if people are not able to vote, <laughs> if not every if every person who wants to vote is not able to vote for a variety of reasons, whether they are intentional or unintentional, that undermines this entire the entire underpinnings of our democratic system. We're not just on a civil rights march. We're on a religious march here. That this is our religious duty. That this is a sense of God's enactment of social justice in this place. All right, thanks. Backers of Amendment 4 collected about a million. Florida disenfranchised more people than the population of over 10 states and U.S. territories and over 40 countries in the world. I mean, I think we all should care about our fellow brothers and sisters. Um, I think we all should care because oppression is like, once it's done to me, it's for easily done to the next person and passed on. Um, we have to stop it when we see it. Um, I think this is a historic fight that we've been fighting. This is nothing new, um, and I think we're going to have to keep fighting. This fall, we will need to vote. Vote to have a scientific and humane response to COVID-19. Vote on policies that are the work of anti-racism. Vote to rebuild our ruined cities in the language of Isaiah. Vote in a way that unites our spiritual and civic lives for the common good.